Greetings, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm neither a uh, IT specialist or a human services specialist, and uh, to be amongst you all and and to uh, listen to your your guidance and input has been uh, magical, to say the least. This is really cool. I'm Jim Galloway. I'm a uh, uh, I was a regional health administrator and assistant U.S. Surgeon General about until about 14 weeks ago when I retired and, and started a consulting uh, effort. Um, but my history is as a physician. I'm an internist and a cardiologist and was uh, working with uh, on reservation for a decade and then, then as a national cardiologist for Indian people for about 22 years. Um, and I gained a lot of insight about working in communities and, and working across uh, uh, vulnerable populations. Um, and as we've been discussing trust and as we've been discussing communication at our tables, it brought to mind a, a story of, of the days when I was back on the reservation. And on the Navajo reservation, there's a place called um, Tuba City, believe it or not, Navajo uh, reservation in Arizona. And um, uh, back in the day, they used to go there, that NASA used to go there to practice because, as you know, American Indians obviously got much of the worst land in our, in our nation. And so they would go there and practice because it was very barren, a lot of rocks, and they would put on their suits and, and, and jump from rock to rock to get nimble with the suits and see what they were like, even though the, the gravity was different. And they were doing that one day, and an old Navajo man was watching them with his, with his grandson. And, looked at, his, at those folks and thought for a minute and turned to his grandson and said, Grandson, would they take a message from me? And he said, Well, I don't know. Uh, they're going to the moon. He said, The moon? He looked up in the sky and said, Yeah, would they take a message from me when they go to the moon? And the grandson said, I don't know, but I'll go ask the chief. So he went and asked the chief of the Nassau folks, and, and there I uh, uh, got their attention and said, Listen, my, my grandfather, who speaks only Navajo, would like to give you all a message that you could take with you. And the chief of the Nassau guys said, Oh, that's great. Let me try that. That's the, let's do that. So they walked over to the, the old Navajo man and handed him a recorder, and he said a fairly brief sentence or two, I guess, in Navajo, and handed the recorder back, and they were a little puzzled. So they turned to the grandson and said, uh, What did he say? And the, the grandson said, Well, my grandfather promised that I, made me promise that I wouldn't say. So they were a little miffed, but went to the local trading post at the Tuba City trading post and went to a nurse behind, uh, a, a, a woman behind the counter there who was Navajo and said, you know, uh, can, can you translate this for us? And they played it for her and she laughed and got the smile on her face and, and uh, said, uh, no, I'm not going to translate that. <laughs> So they were really upset. So they went to the local hospital and went to one of the federal nurses and said, you will translate this. And they played it for her, and she got this big smile on her, on her face. And then she said, well, what he says is, beware, my friend. These men come to steal your land. <laughs> So uh, as we were talking early on about this not being a conference but a symposium, one of the things that I've learned while being here is that this is really a, a symphony, you know, with, with the multitudes of perspectives we have here. I'm, I'm so moved by the, by the discussions and the, the insight that you all have. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I have a disclosure to make, and that is that I work with uh, the, the care coordinated systems you'll hear a little bit about uh, in a few minutes. Um, it's one of those things that I heard about right after I retired, and I thought, this is the right answer. And so I kind of joined in to, to help the movement. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, community benefits, but I'm going to put that on hold in the interest of time, and I, I just want to put a placeholder there for you all to think about, because that's really a, a wheels-on-the-ground way that we can move forward with our hospitals. And, and, and just as a, uh, a brief definition, this is a, a, a piece, uh, actually, section uh, 9007 of the Affordable Care Act and an IRS law that, that requires nonprofit hospitals to give back to the communities. And that includes a community health assessment, an implementation, and then another assessment. And if they don't do that, they can get substantial fines and, and uh, lose their nonprofit status. So hospitals across the land, 85% of which are nonprofit, are doing a lot of work in the public health field, and it's a perfect time for us to join in that effort. 
So with that, um, let me go ahead and, and introduce our, our panel, and then I'll step out of the way, uh, and I'll introduce all four of them uh, at once at the beginning, and, and uh, uh, would like you all to help me welcome them as they come to the podium. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Redding, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Children's Community Health Access Project, Pathways Community Hub. Uh, next is Dr. Ken Gross, the Director of Research and Evaluation from the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers, the Hotspotter Program. You may have read, uh, read about uh, in Atul Gawande's work. Uh, Ann Morris Abdella, the Executive Director of uh, Chautauqua Region Associated Medical Partners. We're really pleased to have her here as well. And Martin uh, Dugan, the Director of Strategy and Market Development for uh, IBM Industry Solutions. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Dr. Redding. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was a challenging task, because usually when I give this talk, it's at least 45 minutes, and most people tell me it takes three times through it before they understand what I've just said. So <laughs> I'm shrinking it to 15 minutes. Um, the good thing, though, is that we just did this persona exercise, and so I grabbed one of the personas. So for group three, you'll know this family well. For the rest of you, I'm sorry. I thought we would all um, at least glimpse the other personas. But the family I'm going to talk about is the Garcia family, um, which consists of the grandmother, um, Ms. Garcia, on the end, who's 40 and widowed on disability. And she's taking care of Angelina, who's two, on the right. Um, and then there's Marisol, the 20-year-old daughter, who has been out of the picture for seven months and is newly pregnant. So um, there's also a history of substance abuse with Marisol. So this is kind of the scenario I'm going to present the Pathways Community Hub model in. OK, so Marisol, I'm going to focus on her. And if we, as a group, when we started to look at the issues that she faced, she was clearly pregnant, so she needed health insurance. She needed prenatal care. She needed housing, transportation. She needed multiple medical referrals, but critically for her substance abuse issues. Now, in our model, there is a concept called pathways. And to give you just very abbreviated history, um, I actually learned um, about community health workers when I was a physician in rural Alaska for three years. And it's funny, because I came here to Hopkins to train as a preventative medicine physician. And our first field trip was to Hagerstown for rural medicine. And I was like, what? <laughs> they have running water. <laughs> they, have, they have a hospital. <laughs> so I was kind of like the black sheep of the group from then on. But, um, so, but really became enamored with the, the model of community health workers. And you know, after training, moved back to Ohio. And my husband and I started up an organization called CHAP, Community Health Access Project, which employed community health workers to serve women at risk, um, pregnant women at risk, and families at risk. And um, we did everything, you know, we trained everybody and got them out in the field. And the one thing that we did that was kind of cool, because we were hot spotting before it was actually called hot spotting, we pulled all the birth certificates for four years. Um, it was also before HIPAA. Uh, regulations. <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> hey, give us those. Um, and we, we had a big, huge map of the county, and we took push pins and put a pin everywhere where there was a low birth weight birth. And we had areas in our county, Richland County, Ohio, which is, you know, not that bad, that had low birth weight rates of 23, approaching 23% in some of our census tracts. That's worse than Bangladesh, you know. So we had clearly pockets that were very, very bad, and that's where we chose to set up shop. So we set up shop there, we um, hired community folks, trained them through the community college, and got to work. But we weren't making the impact that we wanted to make. And about the same time that we were realizing we weren't making an impact, one of our funders challenged us and said, what do you really do? What are your outcomes? And so we developed this model called Pathways. And Pathways are just a tool. They're a tool to take each person and identify their each individual issue, whether it's a health issue or a social issue. The unique thing with a pathway, though, is it's all built around a measurable outcome. So a pregnancy pathway ends with a normal birth weight infant. An employment pathway would end with a letter of verification from the employer that that person is still employed a month on the job. So very tangible, measurable outcomes. 
Once the outcome of the pathway is built, then who are we targeting with the pathway and what evidence-based connection to care are we going to implement to get to the outcome? It's all about the outcomes. So how did this actually work in the field? Well, we had all these community health workers, so we had to come up with something fairly easy to use. We developed checklists that were done at each home visit. A yes response on the checklist triggered the community health worker to think about initiating a pathway. So simply put, if you know yes to the question, do you need a primary medical provider, that would start the medical home pathway. Um, yes to do you need help with transportation, that starts the social service referral pathway specifically coded for transportation. So the information is collected on checklists, pathways are assigned, and followed through to completion. Two things that developed with this model, one, we discovered that there are rate limiting steps, and those are when we're doing everything we can to get through a pathway to try to achieve an outcome and we don't make it. And often that's something we can take back to policy folks and say, you gotta fix this. This, you know, we'll never get to the outcome. Um, there's also the concept of finished and complete pathway where for whatever reason we don't hit the outcome. And those are just as important as the completed pathways. And then we measure the results. So again, for, Marisol's, for Marisol, the 20-year-old, she could be put on the pregnancy pathway, health insurance pathway, medical home pathway, medical referral pathways, and social service referral pathways, just to name a few. But once those pathways are started, they're not lost. They, the, the care coordinator is accountable until those pathways are closed out. Well, you know, that really made a difference. And I'm gonna show you some result slides in a minute but it made a very significant difference. Um, and so we started to think about how do we take this to the next level. For pregnant clients, you know, we had very specific checklists and very specific pathways to use. But this model has evolved. I'm actually now working in Michigan with one of the CMS Innovation Awards and they're doing adults with chronic disease. It's the same concept. You can develop the checklist used on home visits, you track everything with pathways and you measure the outcomes. When you start involving multiple organizations and agencies across the community, you have to have a way to track what you're doing. And that's where the community hub model developed from. So how this plays out in the community, if this is Marisol and somebody, some care coordinator in the community finds her, and this is specifically a community care coordinator, so someone who can do home visits, be in the home, help with all kinds of issues. The very first thing with this model the care coordinator would do would be to check back with their agency that would check back with the hub to make sure that there was no duplication of services. Because when we piloted this model, which is seven agencies in a small suburban county, we had massive duplication just around pregnancy. That's kind of the state of affairs in communities all across the country. Um, we don't talk to each other very well. So once it was determined that, that, that Marisol was not connected anywhere else getting care coordination, then all of the, all of the data collection pieces would, would be put into place. The demographic intake, the checklist, pathways assigned, track to completion, and then when pathways are done, she's exited from the hub system. But the hub can track the history. So if Marisol comes back in two years later, she can be reassigned to that care coordinator if she's already had a relationship, which is critical to making some of the behavioral changes that have to make, that have to happen. So when we did our pilot in Richland County, our very first year, seven agencies, million dollar you know, funding that we already had in the, in the county, we served 19 women at risk. Not very good. <laughs> So we went back to the funder and said, we have got to incentivize agencies, because right now you're paying everybody the same, whether they have one pathway or 10 pathways. And 10 pathways is a lot, of, a lot of issues to resolve, and it takes a lot of time. So we changed the contracts. And the contract said, you can still serve other pregnant women, but if you serve women in these really high-risk areas, in these two specific census tracts, we're gonna give you additional payments um, if you find them early in pregnancy, you get even a higher payment. If you connect them to care, if you track all their prenatal appointments, and then you get a big payment at the outcome. The very next year, we served 146 women, level funding. So we served seven times as many at-risk women, we spent the same amount of money, and we had better health outcomes, which I'll show you in just a minute. So the top graph shows what happened when we implemented 
pathways just within the CHAP agency, just within our own community health worker organization. Members enrolled, that's what happened with their low birth weight. Again, we put ourselves in the highest risk part of the community, and we hit the Healthy People 2010 goal in 2003. When we implemented it at all seven agencies and started to incentivize and pay on outcomes, we saw an almost 2% drop countywide in low birth weight. And it's not rocket science. We were targeting the people that were most likely to have the bad outcome and make sure they connected to care. The other piece, which is sometimes harder to gather, is the cost savings. In Ohio, um, we contract with four out of the five Medicaid-managed care plans. They pay for outcomes. They pay for pathways. And the CFO, CFO for United Healthcare did a study for two years and came back and said, you know, if you manage our members, our neonatal intensive care unit costs only go up, only went up a nickel in two years. We can't say that about any other of our health care costs. So they're still contracting with us and will be for a long time. Um, so let's look at the current system. I'm sure I'm running out of time. Um, so here's the family, the Garcia family. There's you know, Ms. Garcia, Angelina, and Marisol. And I just put a smattering of all of the agencies that are in involved with them. There's many agencies involved with this family. And they're not coordinated. And then I listed all of the needs. You know, Marisol, we talked about her needs, but Angelina needs developmental screening and well child services and immunizations and all of that. Ms. Garcia has her own needs with her disabilities. Everybody needs transportation. Um, but they each have different care coordinators trying to manage all of these needs, and no one's doing a very good job. In the hub system, everything's coordinated through the hub. So all of those needs translate into pathways, and that's why they're different colors, because, there's, because the colors relate back to the funder. So what this allows is that one care coordinator can really get to know that family and have enough funding to actually work with them to meet all of the needs that family unit has. Transportation, there's only one solution probably for that family, but then specifically to work on Marisol's needs, Angelina's, and Ms. Garcia's needs. This also allows like in Michigan, where we have three now brand new community hubs, they're all collecting the same demographic information, the same outcome information through pathways, and the same checklist information. That can be fed into a regional level or a state level, um, very easy to track. Um, what this does is, again, eliminates duplication in all of those communities, helps us target the people that really need the services, coordinates the services, coordinates payment for services, and actually let us create really meaningful reports and invoices and all of that stuff. The cool thing we've done in the Michigan project is actually um, develop the, the tablets that the, the care coordinators can take out into the field. So when they're out in the field, they collect all of their information on the handheld tablet. We've also developed um, educational, um, we developed an education pathway. So we track what educational content's being delivered out in the field and actually record, you know, what changes are happening based on the education given. But they can pull up any video or any educational document that's been approved and do that in the home. So that's really making a huge impact on efficiency for those care coordinators out in the field. And they have real-time connection back to their agency and back to the community hub. So to summarize, this is a model that can help really remove silos and fragmentation. It eliminates duplication, which in alone can save a lot of money. It allows communities to use their own resources effectively and efficiently. We don't have to create new things. We can identify what's already working well and help support it more. It focuses on common goals across programs. Programs don't have to change. This overlays on top. These are the critical outcomes that should be tracked no matter what program's in place. It provides the opportunity for holistic community care coordination, one primary care coordinator to work with a family unit. It pays for outcomes. That's already in place. So it has sustainability features designed 
and it's owned by the community, and that's a critical element of this model. It needs to be owned by the community. So that's, that's the hub. <laughs> and that's, oh, Good afternoon. So I w I'm going to be talking about the data part of, of the equation, because that's where I spend most of my time. And I want to give you two quotes as far as why I think data is so important. One is by John Gardner, the first director of Health and Human Services, and he said, we have amazing opportunities disguised as insolvable problems. And I really think that data is, it can help us unlock what seems like unsolvable um, um, in insolvable problems to see the opportunities. Another quote is Albert Einstein said, if I have an hour to solve a problem, I would take 55 minutes to think about the problem and then five minutes to think about the solution. Once again, the data itself, we, you know, we might know anecdotally and you hear lots of stories, but with the right data, you can really quantify the problem and then start, it's an iterative process um, to then get to solutions. So I want to tell the story about how, can, how we do this at Camden Coalition of healthcare providers. So the mission of uh, Camden Coalition is um, to serve all residents, but, uh, to help the residents increasing their capacity, quality, and access to care in, in the city of Camden. And it's a challenge in Camden. It's one of the highest crime cities in the country, um, the highest murder rate per capita, and one of the low in, lowest income uh, communities in, in, the, in the country. But it has lots of resources. Um, it, we have three hospitals, uh, FQHC, Camden Church is organized for people, an assisted living center, uh, affordable housing advocacy, and, and, um, and health insurance playing an active role. But there was no one to be the spoke for all of that, and that's the role we play as the Camden Coalition. We're kind of the spoke for data, spoke for care coordination, and that's no easy task. These are three, on the left-hand side here, these are three competing health systems. And they don't sit around the table that often, but we got them to sit around the table. So what do we do? We do clinical, we have a clinical side where we do care management teams, um, care transition teams, um, uh, pregnancy, we have pregnancy program, violence intervention program, um, and medication access program. We do practice level as well. Um, so if we pick up high utilizers that don't have primary care, if we put them in a practice that can't handle a complex patient, we haven't done any good. Um, so we're working with practices to try to get embedded care managers there to, to do the catch when we, um, uh, and then we do research and advocacy. So part of the problem, and just from a persona standpoint, here's one patient. Um, and this patient went to one hospital, then subacute rehab, and then hospital two. So we can look at it from the lens of you know, those hospitals. Um, that are our partners. But then we add on, well, this, this patient also has home PT and OT, uh, spend time in a nursing home, then has issues with meals, transport, durable goods, also needs specialist appointments with dialysis, nephrology, transplant, and needs a PCP follow-up appointment, and then the PCP decided needs urology, oncology, and surgery. So these com this complex patients uh, are, are the types of patients we look for in care, with care management to be the spoke to help navigate this crazy system. Oh, and there's even more. So what do we do? We, we have a, um, a timed out service. We work with patients for um, 30 to 60 days, and it starts with at, in the hospital, and we have a home visit between, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, we have another home visit, and we have a, a RN, L, LPN social workers, and we make use of um, AmeriCorps volunteers um, as health coaches as well. Um, and then we accompany them, our staff accompanies them at their first PCP visit within seven days, um, and then goes to specialty visits, and then more home visits. And, um, in the next 60 days, if needed, will continue. And the goal is to remove the barriers, to stabilize, remove the barriers that's keeping them from getting routine standard primary care, um, and then graduate from our program. And in the second 60 days, that's where um, a lot of the health coaches come in to help with things like, I mean, people can't get into affordable housing 
because they need they don't have an ID because they're when they were in prison their brother stole their ID and uh, you need an ID to get into affordable housing and we have health coaches just tracking down their birth certificate from Michigan, taking the person to sit in DMV. Um, the worst DMV story I ever heard, the person was on oxygen. They had a mobile oxygen tank, and our health coach took him to DMV. And you know, you wait a long time at DMV. His oxygen was about to run out before he could get his driver's license, which he needed that driver's license to get into affordable housing. So just all of the things that you learn that are, prevent you. And the reason why he needed affordable housing, because he was living with his sister who had a drug problem, and he was a recovery covering drug addict, so not a great place to be living when he had a, so uh, these health coasters are great for all these miscellaneous things that um, need to get taken care of that are barriers. So what we try to do is stabilize, coordinate, improve health, and reduce costs. But I want to talk to you now about the hot spotting, the data. How does data come in, in, into this? Um, and I, I like to unpackage data. We think about data, you know, in the world now, I hate when everyone says big data. You think it means one thing to everyone. Well, there's really four buckets in this type of work. There's data to understand the problem. There's data to develop interventions to target the problem. There's data, different data sets to identify and engage patients. And then there's different data sets to evaluate the solutions. And I'm gonna walk through each. Um, so quantifying the problem, what do we do at Camden? And this is what I said, um, Albert Einstein, you want to spend 55 minutes understanding the problem, but you need good data. So we got all three hospitals to give us, as the honest broker, their claims data for every year, including um, address, and we do probabilistic linkage so that we can get patients that went to different hospitals and we can quantify on the population level. And you might say, well, how did they agree to do that? We don't, we agree, we're only looking at it from a population data set. We're not going to report one hospital's doing this and that. It's a population data set. And why do we need a population data set? because we don't have population data sets at the local level. There's birth certificates and death certificates, and it, as you might guess, birth, birth and death, what's missing is everything that happens in between. Claims data is a great proxy for the health of a community. So we get that data, they give it to us, so it's managed by data use agreements and IRB agreements. We do the processing, the probabilistic linking, and the geocoding. And there's some stuff in there that's, you know, this is the list of what's right staring at you when you get it. But you can calculate so many other things from that, which um, you can use the ICD-9 codes um, to flag which are avoidable readmissions. You can use the date of admission and date of discharge to find the 30-day readmission. So for your community, this data is sitting there to analyze, to quantify the problem. So here's some of the ways we've quantified the problem. Um, just even, and I call this factivism. I mean, this isn't gonna say, this list of 57% of all the residents of Camden use the hospital, ED or inpatient, at one time during 2011. Um, what are we gonna do about it? Well, this day is, the, but factivism, a lot of people don't know this. So the, the claims data is used for this factivism including what are people going to the hospital for, the top ED diagnoses. Um, in red are uh, ambulatory sensitive conditions, which is a proxy for we need better primary care these, uh, or, or more coordinated care. And then the, the inpatient diagnosis. And, and what's great about claims data, it's, you're not just, you're getting the charges too. What's the cost to the system? So the next is, um, developing interventions to target the problem. So I like to get past the factivism and more what is the data telling us? Well, take this community with all these people and they have different diagnoses, um, diabetes, COPD, but represented by the different colors, multiple chronic conditions, no chronic conditions. Well, the traditional intervention paradigm, whether it's in healthcare or not, it's the siloed approach. Let's put, let's have a diabetes program. Let's have a CDO, C, COPD program or a multiple chronic care condition. Well, what do you do about them? Are they gonna be in multiple programs? Well, the way we like to do it is we like to activate different kinds of data. If I was to say to you, well, in each of these buckets, these people are from the data, from claims data, we know they're high utilizers. Um, now I have a different perspective, and this is what we do. We don't care what disease you have. If you're a high utilizer, which is a proxy for how coordinated your care is, that's who we're interested in, in working with. So it's a different way of looking at the data. So what we do is we roll the patient's data up, not just looking at a laundry list of claims, but if I'm a patient, I have five ED visits, three inpatient visits in the course of a year, two of them were 30-day readmissions, I have an ED to ED 30-day readmissions, and we, we lump them all together um, for your patient and we create typologies. Um, Daniel was saying this before, and marketing does this all the time. So we do cluster analysis. 
And this helps to understand the problem. Well, in Camden, we have one-timers. I call them one-timers. They average about one ED visit. Then we have high ED utilizers. They average about eight ED visits a year. Um, high inpatient utilizers average four, um, um, well, let me go down uh, to the blue, the light blue. These are moderate ED, two ED visits. High ED, eight ED visits. Then we have emerging um, high inpatient utilizers and then high utilizers and then the extreme high utilizers. Now we have a way to start talking personas, if you will, about what types of utilizations out there. But not only do we have the personas, but we also have uh, an idea of how many are in there in our population. So the one-timers, that's 63% in what you're seeing here is the percent of the population up top and then the percentage of all receipts. So the one-timers, I'm not that concerned about. The moderate ED, I'm not that concerned about. They're 25% of all the patients, 12% of the receipts. Well, now the high ED utilizers, we have 1,372 in our community. Now, that gives us an idea. Well, okay, it's a 70,000, you know, when people are talking about high ED utilizers, how many? How many do we have to plan for? Well, this gives us a, an idea. And then we get into the emerging high utilizers. That's 3,065. They are 7% of, of the hospital users, but 32% of the charges. And then the high inpatients, that's only 1% of the population, and it's 15% of the charges. And the... Um, the extreme high utilizers are 0% and 3%. And what's good about these typologies is these high a lot of people will say high utilizers are this and above. And there are actually different kinds of high utilizers above. There's emerging and extreme and high and extreme. When we started doing our care coordination, we tried starting with the hardest of the hard patients. And that requires a lot. There are a lot more issues going on. You need a different kind of intervention for almost each path. So the next thing we do for each one is we then use spatial analysis. And where are the concentrations of high ED utilizers? Um, and you can see in these areas, blue are the, the higher of the, of the areas. What I've been finding is in many communities that we've done this data for, um, the high ED utilizers are approximate to where the hospitals are located. And my hypothesis is potentially, this is just a hypothesis, that if, you have a, if you're two blocks away from an emergency room, that's, that's a pretty close primary care source. But I find it in everywhere. The high utilizers are approximate to the hospital. It's just a hypothesis. Um, and then we see, then we see the, where the emerging high inpatient utilizers are, and these are, the, these are different areas in the city of Camden. And I point these two buildings out because sometimes it's not a neighborhood issue geography-wise, it's a building issue that's making it high. And so you see a high rise in there and uh, a nursing and re rehabilitation facility where there is a, a, a lot. Now again, this doesn't get to the solutions, but it sure helps to paint the picture of what our problem that we're dealing with. And then this is where the inpatient, uh, the, the high inpatient are approximate. Um, and then finally, I just want to get to identifying and engaging patients needing an intervention. I just use claims data, and you think, oh, let's go and keep using claims data. Well, we get claims data historically at year end. It's not going to tell me in real time. And our care coordination program, um, we were waiting for phone calls for people to tell us, yeah, yeah, call us when you have a high utilizer. Um, and we were waiting and waiting, and we'd get calls, and they were difficult patients, not necessarily high utilizing patients. People, um, and um, what we decided to do is we realized we needed um, a different way to find patients in real time. When they're in the hospital is the best time to intervene. And so what we did was we have an HIE in our, in our hospital, in our, in our community, that we've led the effort to build. And as you think of HIEs, they were typically started to be a terminal where the doctor can log in. Did you have lab tests here or here? But it's a great real-time source of data. Like never before is data shooting around ADT feeds from multiple hospitals. So we rigged our system. We get a daily feed of it that every day and we generate a report from it it goes who's in the hospital today it looks back six months tell us who has been in the hospital two or more times within six months and is in the hospital right now we have our daily list to work from and our care teams will go bedside to enroll patients and we find that is the best place to start working with them so it's just another way of another way of using data it's a completely different data set um, but it's to how to identify the right patients at the right time and this is what the daily report looks like it tells where what hospital um, how many days since they've been in and and it's it's so valuable for our care teams The last piece is, uh, which I won't get much into, is evaluating the impacts of um, 
of the solutions. And this really involves, and I always tell everyone, uh, I, and we've set up a system to um, set up data, collect data to help improve, not only prove what you're doing, but to improve what you're doing. And that's been big for this, using data for, for rapid cycle improvement. Um, and um, that, I don't want to leave that out, but as part of the evaluation, that's a big part that you can, con these, a lot of these things are, are works in progress. We're the first to admit we're tinkering all the time. And data plays a big role in seeing what's working, what's not working, and making the changes as fast as possible. So um, I'm welcome, uh, here's my email address. Um, feel free to ask me questions afterwards or during the question and answers, or feel free to uh, send me an email. Thank you for, the, for your time. Good afternoon. I am wondering what in the heck I'm doing up on that podium with these people. Um, I, I have to tell you, we're, we're, we want to grow up to be like Camden um, when we get a little older, a little more experience under our belt. And um, it's, it's a real privilege. It's like being next to Bruce Springsteen. You guys are a rock star in this business, so it's fantastic. So I guess I got invited here because we are actually designated by CMS as an accountable care organization. We are one of what I understand to be one or two rural ones in the country. And um, when the stuff all rolls downhill, we know about it. We know about it fast. We have to respond to it. So I think we make like an interesting Petri dish for all of this. I will say that in our rurality and our countryness, we are not as sophisticated in the fancy slides and models. So you'll bear with me, and I'll talk real fast and try not to hurt myself. Here's who we are. We are very small. We're in the corner of western New York in the southern tier, south of Buffalo, lots of snow, border issues with Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then pressures on our market from um, the remainder of western New York. 130,000 people, not unlike Camden, very poor, aging, um, uh, hips is in all kinds of ways, health professional shortage area designations, for those of you who don't know what those are. Our, we have three community hospital organizations that over the course of time have traditionally been in competition with one another. Um, we have approximately 100 physicians, mostly primary care left now. We used to have a fairly robust specialty uh, base, but they are now starting to sort of fly in and fly out of the community. Um, tertiary care, all of it goes to either mostly Erie, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, Rochester, New York, or Buffalo. And we just opened our first federally qualified health center in January of this year. We are, are the target of our ACO, our Medicare beneficiaries, fee-for-service beneficiaries, and we have a total of about 27,000 Medicare beneficiaries in the community. And I don't know what it's like for some of your states, but um, it, our area, we have a high concentration of Advantage plans. And so we have 40% of our population in managed care, and the remaining 60% are in fee-for-service, and those are the folks that are eligible to participate in the ACO. So our um, program, I'll give you a little bit more um, about the um, specifics of like who makes up the ACO in a minute, but the, um, we have a lot of issues, not only being a HIPSA, we, have, we are at the lowest wage index for um, Medicare in the country. And we're not the only ones, but we are in the lowest. So it makes it a real challenge for us to make any money. There's not a lot of fat in the system. So people are like, what in the heck were we doing signing up for a shared savings program to take more money out of a system that already has very little to give? Um, we had been working on a clinical integration strategy with uh, uh, one of our sister organizations since 2008, which really positioned us very nicely to be ready to go into the accountable care um, movement because this is not something that someone should get about deciding on Tuesday that you want to do. There's so much education and so much preparation that goes into it. Um, this is a portrait of what our community provider group looks like. It is herding cats. We are nothing if we are not independent. I have uh, Independent Practice Association affiliated with our organization. Our hospitals are independent. Everyone competes with everyone. But the, um, the, the thing that is the, the, the kitty food can that is bringing them to the table is the money. 
potentially. Um, there's been a lot of synergy around the multiple enterprises that, that we operate. I actually, in, in the good country way, wear three hats as an executive director of not one, not two, but three organizations. And the Chautauqua County Health Network has been around for a long time. It's a not-for-profit, public health-based, funded by the state health department, um, trying to maximize resources, plan for those resources, work on workforce development issues, physician recruitment, et cetera. The network gave birth to an IPA, the Chautauqua Integrated Delivery System, about 15 years ago. And that's uh, the physicians and hospitals have been working together around Medicare Advantage. And so they had some ideas about the language around medical expense targets and performance metrics. And while we didn't have good data that was coming from the plans in order to be able to do any meaningful um, interventions or planning, we were at least conversant in what the game was going to look like. And so uh, with the clinical integration work that we had been uh, looking at uh, since about 2008, 2009, we uh, decided to go after the shared savings program. So some of our key partners, we could absolutely not do this alone because we just don't have the bench, we don't have the ability to research and stay on top of all of this. So those are some of our best friends. And two of the key leaders in all of this um, affiliation for us have really been the P2 Collaborative of Western New York, who we are actively involved with and is one of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Aligning Forces for Quality Communities in the country. And they've been bringing us a lot of culture change, clinical transformation opportunities around quality improvement, which was not on anyone's radar screen. I have to tell you, in Western New York about five or six years ago, we were really have put a lot of energy into figuring out how do you use data and, and start working together and coordinating care in new and different ways. The other big uh, participant in this is Healthy Link, which is our regional health information organization. We have a, a New York State has put a lot of resource into developing these uh, health information exchanges. And we were lucky enough in Western New York, in part because of the affiliation, I think, with P2, to be part of the Beacon Initiative. And I know a lot of you data people out there know all about Beacon. So it's been a, a, a real opportunity for us. And we've actually been able to help them by being that small petri dish where they could test out a few of their ideas. Um, again, uh, the profile for the ACO is Medicare Shared Savings. We have 7,000 beneficiaries in the program. Bottom line, threshold is 5,000, so we have a little bit of wiggle room. Eight independent primary care practices with 35 physicians, three independent hospital organizations, no tertiary care in this, no specialties in this. Um, for the first time, we brought in uh, skilled nursing. For years and years and years, and in the IPA, the hospitals really didn't have room at the table for skilled nursing. They viewed them as competitors. So we knew that if we were going to get into this business, we had to have a continuum of care. So we have two independent skilled nursing facilities that run, or organizations that run three facilities. We're participating in track one, which is the upside gain share only model, for those of you who care. And our savings rate is 3.4%. Um, which is pretty aggressive for a community our size. We did not do the advance payment. That's the first thing everybody asked me, knowing that we're rural. Did you do the advance payment program? No, we did not. And uh, our clinical integration infrastructure development um, was well underway, which again, you know, sort of positioned us to do this, um, but it is not complete. It is, uh, it, it's dirty. One of the other key things that we um, have been puzzling with is this pressure of Cleveland, Erie, uh, Buffalo wanting our little hospitals and all of our business. They want our hearts, they want our hips, they, they want all that stuff that generates revenue. And the conventional wisdom out there in, um, in health systems and, and what's been um, selling out there to the average person around accountable care is that you need to be vertically aligned to do this work, and so you have to be partnered up totally and complete and owned and locked in with some tertiary and or quaternary care center. And we have choice, we feel like, where we are, and we have had varied referral patterns, and frankly, with varied amounts of uh, out good outcomes, bad outcomes, and so we weren't ready to just, none of our providers were ready to just jump in and align with anyone, because remember, it's a herd of cats out there. 
So the philosophy that we're dealing with really um, absolutely reflects what Hunt was talking about yesterday, which is this nodal idea or creating a web. And so the way that we're looking at approaching this ultimately is dealing with our referrals based on data, based on what our claims are looking like and our outcomes to choose. Do our hearts go to Pennsylvania? Do they go to Ohio? Do they go to Rochester? Same thing with neurology, same thing with cancer. And so we're, we, we're toying with this idea. We have not yet made any of those commitments. But our plan for our ACO was to build the patient-centered medical home as the center. That would be one of the nodes that, that Hunt was talking about. And things would move through that, and that we were going to revitalize our medical neighborhood to support them. So homage to our friends at um, AHRQ, the whole concept of the medical neighborhood and all of these supports. Same idea as the accountable care community. Um, we're focused on Medicare beneficiaries, and we are just positioning ourselves now to try and be more proactive than reactive to what the needs of our patients are. Um, our blueprint for the Medical Neighborhood Revitalization Plan, I hope people out there are familiar with the chronic care model. Raise your hand if you... Ooh, not as many people as I would have thought. Okay, this is, this is a, a good depiction from, from where we sit of the kind of integrated care that we're looking at setting up. The four areas that we really wanted to focus on were developing the patient-centered medical home, establishing a health information exchange locally. We could do certain things with the Rio, but they were locked into New York connections and Western New York connections only. And we were looking at you know, what, this whole huge uh, transfer of patients that were going into Pennsylvania. Uh, dealing with uh, care transitions, specifically people being discharged uh, initially from local hospitals. And this whole issue of patient engagement, that is nothing that is being talked about at the, um, at the accountable care organization level. I'm leaving to go across town tomorrow for a couple of days for the fourth annual ACO summit, one of like 92 I'm sure that are going on in the country right now, but this particular one. And we, f we find that no one ever wants to, um, to talk about the, the patient in the middle of all this. It's all about what doctor is going to get what information and how they're going to manage it. So this is a model that we have come up with that bridges us to the community. And I know it's probably hard to see, but I understand this will be in your SharePoint or, or something. But on the um, left-hand side is the patient-centered medical home. You've sort of seen this. It's all the things like the hospital and certified home agent, health agencies, medical tests, all the clinical stuff that goes around the patient-centered medical home. And what we're trying to do is connect them in a very meaningful and intentional way with community services. And so we have chosen the Office for the Aging is what we call it, a AAA or AOA or all these other things. We are not designated as an ADRC in New York yet, but these uh, entities, Office for the Aging, what we call it New York Connects in every county in the state, they provide information and referral, um, options counseling, they do assessments, they provide uh, eligibility determination, transitional counseling, a variety of different things. And so if you look at the medical needs and the patient-centered medical home side and the living well needs of what the Office for the Aging is trying to do, all of those psychosocial supports. So this is sort of, for you uh, digit people, this is like our little section of uh, the cloud, the local HIE that we're trying to create and trying to build that connection to the Office for the Aging who's over on the left, connecting them with the hospitals, skilled nursing, um, and other uh, service providers in the area. Um, a couple of key things that we've been doing with the HIE, we just this week were able for the very first time to get uh, admission discharge transfer data out of the regional Rio to feed into our system. So now we can start to work with that. If we have somebody who goes up to Buffalo or even when someone's discharged from one of our local hospitals, it, it hits our system and we can, um, we can work on that. But we're spending a lot of time um, working on mapping what those data flows look like between different organizations, trying to figure out who the staff people are that are going to need the information, getting them familiar with the HIE system, and um, rolling it out. 
Um, for those of you who are interested in the public health collaborations that we're trying to bring into this as best practices, the local health information exchange, we're heavy into the integrated community health planning with the hospitals, with the county health department. We've chosen to work on diabetes and cardiovascular disease as the voice of our community has come up and brought that to our attention as a group and also based on what the data has shown us. We're working on um, deploying the patient empowerment program. We're doing CTI, the Coleman model for care transitions. We're offering smoking cessation, which comes from our county health department. Now you know cancer awareness education that comes to the community from Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Office for the Aging does stepping on, moving for better balance and healthy bones for osteoporosis and uh, balance. Um, we are big into the space of CDSMP, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program for Diabetes and Pain Management, and trying to take that as a direct referral from the physician office out to the community to get people um, engaged in that. And then we're doing some work in the built environment, um, farmers markets and community gardens, actually talking to doctors about are you thinking about, you know, to their patients, are you thinking about gardening? Um, are you walking? You know, you should get involved in this group, really trying to create those common messages so that people are hearing it everywhere. Harriet was our little lady. She's an elderly woman on Medicare, and I just sort of had walked her through what would happen if Harriet lived in our community. She was one of the four personas, so the rest of you out there, like uh, Marisol, um, we have another quarter of the room that was familiar with Harriet. But um, if she uh, assumed she was assigned to one of our um, patient-centered medical homes, she would have a master patient index within our health information exchange that would tag her so that all information that was coming from Office for the Aging, coming from uh, Healthy Link, or coming from locals, it would ping her and go into what we call a community view of her with a record that would be permissioned at different levels. She's smiling. Um, that would be permissioned at different levels. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with the other big piece of our, um, of our project here deals with the care coordination. We've chosen to go after care management first, and I feel this is a great place to say it because we chose the guided care model as our best practice, which was developed here at Johns Hopkins. And we've had uh, great luck with it. It's an intensive case management or care management program for cr complex chronically ill folks. And um, this sort of walks you through it. You can get it on the slides. But um, the care manager works very closely with the Office for the Aging and the hospital. They really become the navigator for those people. They meet with them on a monthly basis. There are home visits um, to the point of what does she want out of her life? You know, poor Harriet wanted to just age in place. And so the, the nurse, her job is to try to facilitate making sure that that happens. We're doing a lot of work in advanced care planning, trying to transition the way that practices avoid that, like the plague. Um, the doctors will not have those conversations with their patients, so um, we, we've got some fairly creative solutions that we're trying to bring to bear on that. But really trying to wrap around the whole patient, what is their care plan that they've developed with their provider team? And um, that's just another schematic of the chronic care model with the local stuff, all the community stuff. What's been difficult, I don't think I have to tell you, but that sort of like sums up the way we feel on a daily basis. With the cheese could be the money, it could be your job, it could be any number of things. But again, um, challenges, working capital. To somebody's point this morning, language is huge. I feel like the three years I have spent learning what is enterprise, architecture, and all the rest, and I know my time is up. Um, but uh, I don't think I've got any other surprises that people haven't also seen themselves. Um, the one thing that I would say um, out of all of this is that the ACO model really at this point in time does not engage public health and, and the support services that are out there. So unless you've got people out there who are really banging and advocating for it, um, it, it's not going to be coming to that party very soon. And it cannot minimize for you or, 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 or explain to you the value of learning collaboratives, of picking something that works really, really well in one place that, and porting that over in some fashion, whether it's WebEx, whether it's a practice uh, facilitator who goes from office to office or hospital to hospital, but sharing those strategies and those very simple solutions that come out of PDSAs or come out of just common sense at the front desk. But um, I encourage you as a, as a real tool to bring to this are the learning collaboratives. And I'll hush.
So the last presentation of the day before questions. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, Martin Duggan. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of what we call smarter care. And Nicole talked in the fishbowl earlier on this morning about uh, the concept of smarter care. And uh, this is an example from Spain in Catalonia. Um, and uh, is Mimi in the room? Uh, she, she here? Uh, she asked a question yesterday, how do you coordinate the coordinators? And that's fundamentally what's happening in this project, is how do you coordinate the coordinators? And uh, our closest um, uh, persona was also Harriet, so, uh, so it's sort of related in here, but I haven't done the linkage like uh, two of the other guys did. So um, just a first uh, quick word on what we mean by smarter care. Um, this really is about bringing together the health and social care systems, no surprise on that. That's why we call it smarter, because it is about bringing those two systems together, really to focus on better outcomes, better clinical outcomes, better social outcomes, and better cost outcomes. A big part of that debate is how do you actually drive lower costs within the, within the healthcare system. And we've categorized it in three layers, and it's interesting some different people on the panels have actually pulled these uh, layers out. The first layer really being what we call the foundation. How do you actually bring the data together? How do you actually collect it in such a way that you can actually use it? So that actually, the, when you go to the next layer up, actually looking at the analytics, Camden talked about this a lot, you know, how do you actually really start figuring out how you can find the high cost, high risk patients that are actually the people you need to spend most of the time with if your focus is on a lower cost outcome and a better, a better uh, clinical outcome. And that final layer, the coordination layer, how do you bring all those coordinators together in a way that actually says we're focused on the, that person and the needs. And I love some of the stuff you just put up, uh, up there in terms of how you bring those together in an ACO type model. Right? So that's, that's what we mean by, by smarter care. And what I'm going to do now is just give you an example of what they're doing in Catalonia. That's, uh, which state is that in? It's, uh, it's the, uh, if you understand anything about Catalonian politics, you understand it's a country, not a, not a, not a state. Um, um, uh, I, I was just in Scotland last week and I was having the same debate in Scotland. It's a country. When they were talking about national systems, they meant the Scottish national system, not the UK national system. Um, you get into some interesting uh, political debates as an Englishman in that, in that environment. But uh, um, what they're doing in Spain is they're targeting uh, particularly targeting high-cost, high-risk patients. Um, and the reason why they're doing it is because they have a rather big issue. Um, what basically they have today is about 17% of people over the age of 65 and 4.4% over the age of 80. And by 2050, they expect to be at 30% and 12%. And, and this is just a, a part of the social demographics in the country um, that is really driving a, a, a serious focus on, uh, on el el the elderly people. And that's where the, the intersection really comes between the health and the social care. So what they're in the middle of doing at this moment in time is putting a new health system in place. And it, it, just to give you a very high level comparator, in Spain, or in Catalonia, I've got to be careful with my choice of words there, um, it is a mixed public private model. M multiple payers, multiple private, multiple public uh, uh, providers, um, not quite as disaggregated as you have here in the US, but, uh, but not, not a single payer system and, and not a single provider type, type system. So it is quite fragmented in, in the way that it's actually put together. And what they're trying to, there's a number of different elements of what they're doing with the new health plan, new different payment models I'm not going to go into today, uh, payment for outcomes and things like that. But a key element of what they're trying to do is orientate the system more around chronic patients and really understanding how can they actually address the needs of, of, those, of those chronic patients. Um, and, and really put in you know, um, an integrated care model together that really brings together the hospitals, the primary care uh, centres, nursing home facilities, mental health network, and also all of the social services that support that. So they're trying to bring all of those, well, they are bringing all of those together. Um, and, and really with the aim of providing proactive uh, care for people with complex and advanced chronic disease. And I'll come on to a little bit of their segmentation that they've done on the next slide. What they're looking, though, for is a 24 by 7 um, proactive model that actually can, can react to any incidents that the patients actually have before they get more costly and more, and more uh, um, uh, debilitating. And this is, there's a time element associated with this that, that they're trying to particularly focus on as well. Okay. So, um, oh, and final element, I've got to remember my notes here. Um, substituting acute uh, conventional hospitalization uh, with uh, uh, subacute facilities, daycare facilities, and proactive home care. So the basic premise is the worst place for these people to be is actually in hospital. 
uh, both from a cost point of view and actually they tend to catch um, other diseases while they're there and they're more likely to die. Um, and uh, so home is actually, in most people's cases, the best place for them to actually be. So. They're in the process of uh, running a pilot, uh, and, and we call it a pilot. It's an operational pilot. It's actually running for real. Um, but the, the reason why we call it a pilot is because we're trying to find out what the actual outcomes and what the cost elements and what the returns actually associated with those actual outcomes are. And to start off with, they're focused on two particular groups. Uh, you can see them listed here. Uh, I don't think for any of the medical people in the room this is uh, any surprise. It's patients with multimorbidity um, uh, or very difficult clinical uh, management conditions and people uh, what's on limited life prognosis. So people coming to the end of their life and the, at the most costly time of their, uh, of their care and uh, really trying to get them into palliative care type environments. It's about 5% of the population in total fit into that category. Um, they're starting off with 0.5% of all the patients as their, their first uh, uh, cohort, if you like, taken through here. And the intent is to, to, I mean, these really are the highest cost and highest risk. And I remember from the video that was uh, that produced on Camden, uh, the quote there I always remember is 1% of patients with 30% of the costs. Um, in Scotland, uh, two weeks ago, they quoted 3% of patients off 50% of the cost. And in Belgium, in the same conference, uh, the guy, guy there quoted that 5% of patients were 60% of the costs. Now, different types of healthcare systems, slightly different uh, populations being managed, but broadly, you get the point. Right? <laughs> it's not a big number of people. And it's a huge part of the cost. Right? So, so the question around segmentation is, and, and how you actually find and identify those patients, a big part of what we see in the analytics layer. And the analytics came up in a couple of other discussions during the, uh, the symposium. I think that's a significant part of uh, where we see coming through in the next couple of years. So in Catalonia, they're doing this project with us to, to really try to identify the really high cost, high need patients. The plan is to roll it out across the whole of the, uh, whole of the region uh, across, and, and across a wider group of uh, profiles as well uh, over the next two years um, to see how that can really go. What they've actually done, though, is they've actually put some technology in place, and the idea basically being how do you actually coordinate the coordinators? How do you actually put you know, use technology to actually support people in putting those plans together and addressing the needs? So the first thing they did is put together a 360-degree view of the patient. And I'll come on to that in another slide in a second to give a bit more detail because it's a bit small to see it there. The second is how do you provide a care management workstation for people who have a need to be involved in that care activity? And the third bit then is how do you pull a plan together that actually allows you to see all the interventions that are actually taking place and then actually can see who's actually participating in those different activities. And I'll dig into two of those in, in, in the detail, more detailed slides. So the first is the 360 degree patient centered vision. I think you can probably see the words in red there. This is the first time they've ever been able to have this information in one place. They didn't replace all of the existing systems. The existing systems all still exist. What they actually have now, though, is for the care coordinators can actually see the whole thing in one place. And for the, for the technical guys in the room, this was an overlaid architecture on top of their existing systems. The systems feed this, this new uh, care coordination system. Okay? And you could get everything from stratification for the clinical risk groups through the medication that they're receiving, their planned activities that are, that are already going on. You could see them in one screen and in one environment. Of course, you have to have the right access to be able to see these, and the plan is to roll it out to different types of groups at a later stage. But, uh, but you also have a view of the plan. And within that plan, different people have different roles, different security profiles. Everybody in this situation, everybody can see the top layer of the plan. Uh, our group uh, earlier on, uh, the question was raised about the minimal set of information that's required. In this case, the minimal set of information that's required is everybody needs to know that what, who is involved in the plan and the, at least the high level of what they're doing. Depending on the profile and the, and the security profile of the individuals, they may be allowed to see more. Right? But at every stage, people know what the next intervention is and what is actually planned. And if something doesn't quite go right, then you can re redefine the plan and actually look again at what outcome you're trying to achieve. But fundamentally, this is about how do you actually determine the outcome for the individual and actually how do you put the plan together to, uh, to support them in doing that. So just to summarize, um, that's uh, an example of what we call smarter care. Um, you you uh, can see uh, um, more about Smarter Care at uh, the URL that's on there. 
We've also uh, produced a paper, which I see people have been uh, looking around, on uh, the impact of social demographics. Uh, that's something we do from what we call the Kerem Research Institute, um, really looking at uh, some of the models. And you know, I've been talking about Camden for many, many years uh, um, around, around the world in terms of you know, practices that people actually are doing and actually working on. And a, a call to anyone here, if you do have any ROI uh, type of information from doing these types of programs, we're very keen to understand because one of the things that I, I talked about last year and we're still trying to find and still trying to do is where are those examples of people really doing it that are actually able to get return on that investment? Because we're very keen to find a way to publicize that and actually get that message out there that if you do these types of interventions, if you do these types of systems, that actually you know, it makes a big difference, not just on the social side, not just on the clinical side, but actually on the cost side. Right. And uh, with that, I'd say thank you very much. Well, that was outstanding uh, presentations from all of you. Thank you all very much. And now we'd like to uh, open it up for questions, if we can, for any of the four. Um, and uh, if you could, if you, if you know, direct your question to the person that you'd like to answer it. Otherwise, it'll go to the panel. The question I have for you is, step over the commercial side of the world, where you've now started to do an ACO model. Have you approached any of the commercial plans, extolling the virtues of what you're doing, and looking at that and asking them if they would be a funding stream for you ongoing? We in Camden, where there are two main uh, insurers, one of them covers about 20% of our lives and the other 80. Unfortunately, the one that covers the 20 is the one that's willing to work with us. The one that covers the 80 keeps dragging their feet, I think, until they're forced to do it, because we're providing, we're saving them money at with foundation dollars, and our sustainability is model is for them to kick in and support this. And they're a supporter of it. They say they love it. They're just not a supporter with the dollars yet. So, but I, one is not all, but one is supportive and the other is not. Um, <clears throat> our partnership with the Medicare Advantage commercial payer um, has, we've been working with them for a long time, and in essence, the arrangement that we have with them is very accountable care-like. And so we have actually used a certain amount of the proceeds um, that we have earned through that program over the years to reinvest into the infrastructure, particularly the data piece and care management piece for the ACO. Um, there are varying degrees. We have three main payers in our area, and they are very interested in, um, in this arrangement. We are being very, very cautious to just stay true to what it is that we're doing right now. Maybe a year from now or two, we'll decide to even have those conversations, but right now, we're just not ready. Great. Thank you very much. Next question. So the, one of the questions is on the, uh, the social services side of the equation. Uh, I think there was an emphasis on the medical side of a lot of this. Obviously, that's the cost driver. There's a lot more data on that side. Thinking about how do you bring in the social services, the community services into these kind of models, not only you know, uh, reimbursing them or sharing, sharing savings with them, but how you even account for the data, the information they're generating, and knowing how that's affecting the the actual patient or the customer in some ways. And I know it's early on, but I'm curious about your thinking about how to do that uh, in a more robust way going forward. And I guess that's, I, that, that's open to um, anybody who wants to pick it up. From the Camden perspective, social is, um, we, we hone in on the medical, but it, social policy is medical policy, is health policy, because every patient that we work with um, there are social barriers to be to be removed, and I think that's where um, our care management teams come in the, the in the greatest need of removing those social barriers where the medical system isn't. Um, one of the problems is the medical system's ability to collect data on social related issues. We triage all the patients that come in our daily list, and because we have access to the medical record, so we're trying to triage which patients are of that daily list and. 
to look for who has social, all we, our care teams want to know, do they have social support, do they have housing issues and insurance? Those are the three main things. You can't find that anywhere. They have to bury it in the record. So, in, you know, one of the barriers is, is even just data collection to get the medical establishment, but um, it plays a big part after. We, we know that if they're high utilizers, there's a social component and we start working with them but we, cap, we, we started intervening with the healthcare, but it's a data collection issue as well. We, um, uh, if we could get that, and when we've talked to people um, about getting that collected, they said, oh, it takes you know, a new screen and their EMR costs this much money and they just implement it and so. One of the things that we're seeing in a number of other countries is the realization by the health payers that actually the biggest return on investment that they can actually achieve is by investing in social care. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I ask you the question about, you know, have you got evidence for that? Because there is evidence in several countries that actually if you spend a dollar on social care, the return or the, and the saving, direct saving in the first year can be as high as $1.25. And that's a, that's a number that's uh, scientifically proven from the UK. Uh, we've got similar numbers from uh, Spain. We're looking in Japan and Australia at the moment. And I'd love to you know, get some examples from the US. And once that information becomes presented to the health payers, if you can get them engaged, right, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, as long as the government is willing to allow people to actually engage in that service, right? And that's been one of the restrictors in some countries is uh, that actually the government hasn't wanted to receive the money from other environments because you get the divides of it's social care and, and that's my responsibility, right? Um, but the, those barriers seem to be coming down very quickly. And we're toying with um, two particular uh, interventions that we're using, the um, Care Transitions Initiative really looking at what the cost of doing that um, coaching for the program looks like to the Office for the Aging, and what would that look like if it were reimbursed? And we've started to have some conversations with the payers on the commercial side from, from the public health support side of it, um, but also looking at it from the ACO. You know, we will know very specifically you know, based on rates, what number of readmissions were prevented and what would that look like in real cost and what share of that would be likely to go back to continue to support OFA and something like that. Um, the other one is what does it cost to do the chronic disease self-management program? Um, you know, six sessions, two hours, people have to be trained, they have to prep for the classes. What does that look like in terms of a PMPM -PM or something like that? But we're, we are definitely starting to noodle around the idea, understanding that if we want those services to be there, we can't rely on the government's uh, generosity to continue to underwrite it because they'll be on to the next flavor of whatever in three years and those programs may be gone. So if we really want them, we're going to have to find a way to pay for some of it. Well stated. Um, as a side note, um, uh, if I remember correctly, there was a, an article recently in the Journal of the American Medical Association that looked at how, uh, ER visits uh, um, before and after housing was found for homeless uh, folks and found substantial reduction of around 50% reduction in ER visits um, with, with the availability of housing for that population. Um, no, no cost savings were done in that, but, but certainly it's, it's pretty obvious the, the cost savings and those kind of numbers. Other questions? Yes, sir. Particularly in Camden, uh, since I live in Philadelphia and we, we look at you, um, uh, what about relationships with jails and prisons as well as schools? Great question. Both of those, we've taken steps in one is the in the jails we've tried to get the jails to use the HIE so that they have a better understanding of the all the visits and the lab work beforehand um, that's a work in progress that we're working on the schools it, same thing uh, we think the HIE is a great way and and I've been an advocate for somehow getting school nurses as the you know they are the eyes and ears in the 
in, in every school, almost a care manager. And we've tried to get the HIE there too, because so they can see if a child has been to the emergency room and what for. And actually the school rejected. They didn't want that level of sign off on um, data coming through. Um, so that was a big challenge. It still is a big challenge. Um, and even getting a collaborative, I mean, the school in Camden school system has its major challenges as well. They just got taken over by the state, so now everyone's being changed. Well, come across the bridge. We were taken over yeah, yeah. about 10 years ago, and it's not much to yeah. look at. But I, those are two great, great, I mean, the, I think we're making more progress in the jails, but I do think the schools are. Isn't that sad? Yeah, it is sad. <laughs> yeah, but I think the schools are just primed for us to be um, having, you know, it, activating the school nurses to be, take a more uh, role and in giving them more information about what's going on with the health care outside. And is the issue with the jails and prisons a technology one? Is that the hesitation? Because it would seem to benefit them as well. Well, the, there's a vendor who has the medical services contract for the jails, oh, and yeah. that this isn't in their contract. <laughs> It's just like, I don't, and it's, um, yeah, it's more of a political, like, this isn't, and we're trying to get that to, that this, the county, which has the jail system, to get this as a required part of any contract that you, your, that the HIE data will be part of the care you deliver so you can provide better care. So, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We've got a few over here. Yeah, so, in, um, most of the speakers on stage, there was a, there's some very strong analytics component to what you're doing. I guess the question I have is, is there, what, that once you had the data and we're actually doing the analysis, and in addition to identifying who to target and what, were there any other lessons you learned that surprised you or lessons or correlations you've seen or lessons you're on the verge of learning that are surprising any of you? And are there, any, are there challenges in getting what you're learning from the analytics to get sort of accepted and buy-in? We actually had a study done. Um, we gave four years of data to the Ohio Department of Health. They matched it to vital statistics. They gave it to OSU biostatistics, and they did a case match control looking at um, differences in low birth weight rates. And the state really came at it thinking it was higher access to prenatal services. There was no statistical sig significance between the case match control and the intervention group. It was really all the other all the other things, getting transportation, helping with child care. I mean, from our best guess, at least, it was all of the other supports that community care coordinators can do. Um, it's not just about the health care. So. My big lesson learned is it's, non, it's from a non-data perspective. I think data is half the battle. It's the what do you do with it, but not even what you do with it. I think it, d data and research is an iterative process, and there has to be the right people around the table. Um, I, I think the one place that got it, the one model that got it right is the, the, the CompStat approach. They got the right people, look at the right data as far as the process, and it, you, know, you get certain outcomes, and it has to be iterative. And that's what I challenge with, yeah, we got this data, but how do we get to, especially when we're in between all these hospitals, and we want them to take a look at it, but how you build that human component system, that's decision making, they can look at some data, and they want to ask more questions, they're like, wow, that's interesting, can we look at this? You know, the research component supports that, del delves a little bit deeper and goes back um, and, and presents back till we finally get. I call it the discovery, uh, ideate, and then innovate. So this discovery process that can lead to ideation, that can, to innovation, but that's, yeah, I'm, I'm the first to admit that data only gets us a part of the way, and it, the other part still, I think, that the, what's the best way to do that, I think, is, is a challenge. We're just at the starting edge of really being able to find the data and, and, and look at it. In fact, our, our claims information just arrived from CMS maybe two months ago and is in the process of being uh, aggregated and, and chewed apart. Um, but I will say from the clinical support piece of it with the um, data registries that we've been using for chronic disease management. Um, there was a lot of kicking and screaming in the beginning from the doctors who did not want to participate or, you know, ho-hum, it's more data. And um, we 
really worked hard and have been working hard at trying to standardize the way that they report the information so that we are for sure comparing apples to apples to apples across records. But um, when we start to show them what their performance looks like on an annual basis or over the course of three years compared to their partner, compared to the overall network, I can't tell you what kind of attention that gets. And um, they, are, they, are, they are naturally competitive, I believe. And so um, it has really uh, engaged them in ways that we were not sure that we were going to get from them. And um, the, the latest sort of breakthrough on that is that we've been trying to introduce the concept of PDSAs or you know, Plan, Do, Study, Act quality improvement cycles within the practices. And they were like, you know, over my dead body probably two or three years ago. And now it's sort of like, OK, so what's Dr. X doing over there that his numbers are so high? Bring it to me. And that's what I mean about the collaborative learning. But it takes time. It's a process. But the data can be very valuable. So I think in, in Spain, they've seen some of that last, last part as well. But the, the, the main reaction that uh, they, they described was, wow, you know, is that really what, what's going on? And that's really what we can see and what we can do? How can we get more of it? And that's pretty well continuous. And one other thing that I would say about it is it's been useful for us to see the, um, the fragmented nature of where people are going for their care just on some really high level looks at claims data. Um, you know, leakage is what we call it on this side of the business. But um, whether it's from your network, from your community, from the people who should be providing the care, when you can get that information, it tells a really important story about just where people are buying their services from and what kinds of services. So it's, it's really valuable. Very cool. Thank you very much. Next question. Yes, sir. We've been focusing on the use of claims data, and that's certainly a valuable resource. But if you started thinking about the other sources of information that you may want to be drawing on, particularly patient reported um, experience and risk factors through a health risk appraisal or, or something like that, the, just your thoughts on the next step in your quest for data to support the analytics? It is, it is a challenge to get other data, and the, the easiest data is the claims data. Um, every hospital collects it. We've worked with some other communities to activate their claims data, and it's collected in a standard way, and certain process can be, can be done on it. So to collect other data, um, when we start working with the patients, um, we, we start collecting data, um, and which is fascinating, because we see where the medical record had no indication of depression or anxiety. And then we ask bedside to list their chronic conditions. And they so many times, it's just not. Some mental health issues are never reported in the. Um, so those are some of the other. But those are only that we can't get those at the population level. We have to assume that it's an, for certain things, the claims data is an, an under-report from what we learn when we're actually working with patients. But I think the HIE, um, right now our HIE is just a, um, everyone has read access. We can look at, it's, the hospitals have read write access, so their, their ADT feeds come in. I think when we have, it's going to be all primary care providers have read write access, their data is going in as well. Um, and they have write, read in write access, and it's going to be pooled together, and that will give us more of that that data, um, but that is a good point. The, the data from the patient's perspective, how to get that data into it, um, um, is, is something that you know, is not, um, um, it's not part of an existing administrative data set that we can tap in, but it is important to, to think about putting that into the equation. For us, um, the patient portal is the next frontier. Um, I think it comes with meaningful use, too. And we are just starting to look at what the modules have available from that perspective and just getting the practices to start to you know, purchase the module, how to use it. So we're going to be working on a pilot with a couple of them. Um, as far as direct uh, health risk assessments, we have thought about it but we haven't done anything specific. We're actually looking at doing assessments across the board for patient activation. If anybody's familiar with Judith Hibbard's tool, the patient activation measure, um, it's a very simple questionnaire that can be asked that gives you a sense of how, how empowered the patient is 
to want to make change or capable of making change. And so we feel like, you know, above and beyond anything else with the clinical information, we're going to want to take a look at that. So. Just a quick follow-up on the clinical information side. One of the weaknesses of the existing EHRs is they do not really allow you to do population-based analysis. So are you, do you find yourself, have, have you already, are you planning to do a population analytics layer overlay fed by the EHR so that you have access to that for population, the clinical information for population analytics? Yeah, we can't get access. The three hospitals won't give us their EHR in aggregate for population research. It's, um, it's held very tightly by the IT, and only one person knows how to query the system. And um, it, it was an amazing process, um, um, which I think is what's wrong with it. The, there's no real data and research component within the hospitals. It's all been lumped under IT. And so I asked, what do the health informaticists do? They, they have health informatics in the hospital. They want to get into the EMR data on the population level. They said, well, they have to come to this, this one IT person who knows how to get it out, and they have to come with the question. I said, well, I know as a data person, I need to see what's in there and work with it. And they said, yeah, but they're not allowed to see it. So I'm just amazed at how much is probably sitting in that EMR data that's not being used for research. And I really think it needs to be taken out of IT and made a department of of informatics that has, that takes over the keys to it once the system's set up. But um, yeah, we, we haven't been able to really take a look at the EMR. Pieces of it will come into the HIE, but not um, only what can be traveled. Um, but now there's, you know, there's things that can be on top, like natural, natural language processing. A lot of it's in note form, which makes it not as, not any good. Some of it's discrete fields. So, um, but, you know, I, I do have some confidence that some of the EMR stuff with some of the technology that's out there now, like natural language processing to turn words into discrete fields, if it says the word homeless, flag homeless, you know, into field. So, but we just have to get access. Someone has to get access to it to use it. Probably one more question. Uh, there we go. Daniel? Uh, um, s this actually may sort of lead us into tomorrow's conversation a bit. So all the conversation here, is, which is terrific, it's about after somebody's chronically ill. So the barn door is open, <laughs> the horse is out, and we're trying to as the pay and chase, basically. You know, how do we how do we reduce the cost there? Have you thought as a community uh, uh, about how do you use these tools, this kind of thinking, this kind of approach to work upstream to say, well, what do we know about these people? downstream that we can think about preventing it because we have access to clinical data maybe that is going to be indicative of uh, preventable stuff going on and um, different subject but it, but yeah. important one our model actually doesn't do any of the direct clinical data collection but we're going to be linking into the HIE what we're collecting is all that community information which is exactly where you want prevention to be is based in the community. So, so our next step is how do we take all of this community care coordination and link it to the health care coordination that's going on? Because we believe that work really does have to happen at the community level, a lot of it at least. Um, we, we haven't been. Oh, it, with the results that I showed you, we have the ability to, because I think, you know, if we narrow down who those early stage high utilizers are, or even those high ED utilizers are, we've narrowed that down from 70,000 patients to maybe 2,000 start focusing, and we can drill down even more with predictive analytics. I think predictive analytics of the whole population isn't as useful, but when you narrow down the typology types and then do it, it's more powerful. But um, so I think we have the ability to do it. I think our problem is, is we're being judged on how much did someone cost last year and then how much do they cost the year after you work with them? Someone who hasn't started costing a lot yet, um, which doesn't mean we want, don't want to, but mm -hmm. as far as our business model, I mean, our, the model of sustainability is to have numbers to prove. Um, so someone, if we got to them early and we prevented them from being a high utilizer, it's the, the insurance companies don't buy that as a, uh, um, as a formula for uh, you know, some kind of shared savings. So that's, uh, that's our dilemma. That's a really good point. Yeah, I think that, that addresses the question of preventable, you know, what are the preventable costs, and if those benefits are generated in one area that ascribe to another area, who gets the credit, and how do you account for that? 
-hmm. and how have you avoided costs and who gets the credit for avoiding cost. Yeah. So yeah. that's next year's conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't, don't, I mean, I mean the, the element about predictive analytics is, the, the element about predictive analytics is, is quite active uh, in the research places around, around, around the world. Certainly we're doing a huge amount of research on that at the moment and products just starting to come to market that really include the elements. But someone asked the question, what's the big question? Uh, I'll give you another example. In New Zealand, they're using predictive analytics to actually work out what, who, who are going to be the million dollar welfare recipients. Yeah? And they realized that their, their assumptions on timing were wrong. And they actually went to the, to the Prime Minister went to the, to the electorate, actually as part of the election, and said, we need to change the privacy laws because by the age of 11, the kids are already conditioned for their, for their unemployment as the million dollar welfare recipients. Mm -hmm. So they changed the law to allow them to go down to the age of two to three to actually start putting interventions in place. And most of those interventions were actually health related interventions, health and education related interventions. And that, that, that was because they had proved that the business case actually worked. So that's why the ROI stuff in terms of, you know, how can we actually prove these things really actually make a difference? Because that gives you the business case to then start actually going and looking 10, 15 years ahead, whether it's uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, sugary uh, uh, drinks uh, stuff or, or other things, right? And, but that's, that's to me the future, I mean, and the future's here. Yes, indeed. And, and indeed, one of the uh, uh, some of the comments that were made uh, yesterday and earlier today about low birth weight infants is a great example of, of significant prevention that we can utilize uh, immediately, actually. Very good. Well, listen, everyone, I'd like to say thank you very much for staying so late tonight. And uh, uh, thanks for being here. And help me uh, give these folks a great hand. Thank you.